Good morning. Welcome to Wise Drive Baptist Church. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. We hope you've had a wonderful week and are ready to worship our Savior once again. Here's just a few things that are coming in the way of announcements here at the church. If you're graduating from high school or college, please let us know. We're trying to put together our usual graduation Sunday, and because of that, we want to honor you. We know that seniors have gotten particularly shortchanged this year with all that's been going on with COVID-19, and we want to make this day special for you. So please, if you are a high school graduate or a college graduate, or you have one in your family, please just send us an email at nick at wisedrivebaptist.org, and we'll get you added to the recognition list. On Wednesdays, Pastor Darrell is going live on our Facebook page. Tune in at 6 p.m. as he continues through his study on the Gospel of John. Parents, is your student signed up to go to Crossroads Summer Camp this year? If so, we are having an update meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m. on Zoom. For all the login details, please contact me directly. My email address is nick at wisedrivebaptist.org and my cell phone number is 803 757 9648. Again, 803 757 9648. As a way to fundraise for summer camp and other events throughout the year, our student ministry is selling car wash tickets to Tidal Wave Auto Spa. If you're here in Sumter, this is the car wash that's located across from Logan's Roadhouse at the corner of Wilson Hall Road and Broad Street. Tickets are only $10, and this, these tickets are good for one of the $20 premium car washes. You can't beat that kind of deal. These tickets that we have in stock right now are good through September 30th of 2021, a whole year away. So, if you would like to order, please just go to the student ministry page of the website, scroll down to the fundraiser tab, and you will see the link there that you can order these tickets. We can process your payment online and we'll even mail the tickets to your house. Don't forget, you can still give your tithes and offerings online. Just go to www.wisedrivebaptist.org forward slash give. It's easy, secure, and you can even set it up to automatically withdraw your tithe on a recurring basis. If you need any help getting this set up, please just call the church office at 803-469-0496 and leave a message. Christine will call you back and help you get everything set up. You can also mail your checks to the church. The church's address is 2751 Southwise Drive, Sumter, South Carolina, 29150. Again, thank you so much for tuning in with us this week. We hope you have an amazing week. And remember, we may be quarantined, but we are not isolated. Let's get to worship. Bursting. 
today is about a very special man who was walking with two men that didn't even recognize him. Have you ever been blindfolded before in a game like maybe you had to be blindfolded to taste something funny and guess what it was or maybe somebody you really trusted put a blindfold on you and led you around or maybe you had to listen with your ears and see if you could guess what you were hearing instead of seeing it with your eyes. But it was kind of like that for the men on the road to Emmaus. The stranger said to them, Do you not believe everything that the prophets have said about the scripture? They predicted that he would have to suffer and die on the cross before he entered the kingdom of glory. Can you guess who this special man is talking about? It was Jesus talking about the resurrection. So, they were so surprised. They knew that Jesus had been crucified and definitely weren't going to guess him to be the man standing right beside him. But God had to allow these men to have their blindfolds removed so they could see. And I think it's like that sometimes too for us. Sometimes we need a little help seeing Jesus right in front of us. And so sometimes it's easy for us to guess what we might be hearing or tasting or where we might be going with our blindfold on, but sometimes it's not and we need a little help. And that's what God does for us too. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus, not only to die on the cross, but to also be raised again. We thank you that he lives and he lives for us every day as we should live for him. Please help us take off our blindfolds so that we can see him in our daily life too. In Jesus' name we pray. All the children say, Amen. Yeah. 
earth is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch a dark around become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my life becomes enthralled in your love when all things that's around become shadows in the light of you. I worship you. I worship you.
Good evening and welcome to the worship of Wise Drive Baptist Church. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, of course, I can't hardly see you, but I know you're out there. I've seen you on Facebook before. It's, it's kind of funny that uh, while we're on Facebook, the Bible teaching and the preaching has, has reached hundreds of people. And uh, we don't have hundreds of people, so, so we know that it's getting out somewhere and going some places. If you don't mind now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father, we just thank you, Father. Even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, there's so many good things you're doing. But God, we pray and ask in the name of Christ today, Father, that you would stop this thing, stop these, this, this terrible illness, Lord, from harming anybody else. We pray for the Lord, for those who have it right now, God, that you would bring healing to them. And we pray, Father, that you bring healing to them in such a way, God, that everybody would know that you did it. And Lord, you'd be glorified. We pray, God, that you be with our nurses and our doctors, all the technicians, Father, that are treating these people, that, that, Lord, you would just protect them because they're putting their life on the line. They're putting their family's lives on the line. So be with them, Father, and bless them. In the name of Christ, Lord, Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. Uh, I want to read us some scripture this morning from uh, Acts chapter 8, the first eight verses. And Saul approved of their killing him. He's talking about Stephen. Uh, stoned him to death and Saul approved of their killing him and on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him but Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house he dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip, who, who, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, and in, for with shrieks impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. I'm going to tell you something that you might not know. There are some things in the Bible that are not divinely inspired. There are some things in the Bible that are, that are not profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There are some things in the Bible that are not God-breathed. Now, before you get too upset at me, I want you to hear me out. The chapters and the verses and the, most of the divisions are not in the manuscripts. Uh, they were added much later to help people when they were studying the Bible to, to go back and say, well, I read that in Paul's epistle to the, to the uh, First Corinthians, and it was in chapter 9, verse 3. Uh, you're probably wondering why I would bring something like that up, but here's the reason. The book that we just read from is traditionally called the book of the Acts of the Apostles. I don't know who named it, but it doesn't really make any sense to call it that. After chapters 4 and 5, you really don't see the apostles very much except for Peter. You see him some. Paul is saved in chapter 9, but he doesn't start his missionary journeys until chapter 13. So it seems to me that the key to what is the theme of, of, of the book of Acts is really not about the apostles. I think the key can be found in the first chapter, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's what Jesus told his disciples, his apostles, in chapter 1, verse 8. And in my opinion, that's the theme or the key to the book of Acts. It runs all through the book, and it's about the, salva the word of salvation spreading and new churches being started. And today we want to look at the first step in spreading the gospel, the church in Jerusalem was growing by leaps and bounds, but it wasn't spreading outside the city. Jesus told his disciples, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. And they were doing a good job in Jerusalem. I mean, they were gangbusters in Jerusalem. But there doesn't seem to be much interest in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So what got these new believers out of Jerusalem and spreading the gospel? Persecution. Verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout all Judea and Samaria. God, now, God didn't cause the persecution, but he didn't do anything to stop it either. It appears that nothing short of persecution was going to get them out of Jerusalem and into all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And nothing short of persecution was going to get them to obey Jesus. And that, that is everyone except the apostles. I want you to note that when the, when the church scattered, it said everybody left Jerusalem except the apostles. The very men that Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth, they stayed in Jerusalem. 
It also appears that in 2020, a pandemic has scattered the church again. And I, for one, can say, thank you, Jesus. Now, I'm not saying I thank you for the pandemic. Uh, on quite the contrary, I pray every day that God will destroy this virus. I pray every day that God will protect people from this virus. And there's specific people that I pray every day, sometimes several times a day, that God will protect them because I know they're on the front line. What I thank God for is for scattering us, His church. I'm thankful for Him getting us out of our own personal Jerusalems into the world. I'm thanking God for getting us out of our own personal kingdoms and into the world. Now, brothers and sisters, we are now the scattered church. And I, for one, do not want to go back to business as usual. I like it out here. I like that we're getting the gospel message outside the walls of the church being church building. I like being the scattered church. And this morning we're going to examine what happens when the church is scattered. One thing that happens is the, the scattered church parts with the establishment. Go back to verse 1 again. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard, heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many were paralyzed or lame or healed, so there was great joy in that city. Again, I want to remind you that in the very first chapter of the book of Acts, Jesus gave his disciples a mandate. He expected them to fulfill that mandate. He expected them to pass that mandate on to us. And that man mandate was this. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit of God fell on the disciples in the upper room. They came out of that room like somebody had lit a fire under them. They were so motivated that Peter preached the first Christian sermon and about 3,000 people were saved that day. At the, end, at the end of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that those Christians were, were devoted. They were devoted, they were committed to the, to, the, to, the, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And every day, the Bible says at the end of chapter 2, people were being saved and added to their number. The church in Jerusalem was continuing to grow all throughout, even, to, even up to chapter 6, when we see the first complainers. Now, I'm not going to address whether or not their, their complaints were legitimate. I just want to point out that when people begin to complain, things have stopped being a movement and they become an organization. The apostles dealt with the complaints by adding another layer of organization called the, called the deacons. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with being an organization. Organizations are able to harness the power of movements. But you have to be very careful when you begin to organize that you don't kill the creativity and the excitement of the movement or even the mission. When the organization becomes an establishment, that's when the real problems begin to emerge. And the first big problem is the loss of that original mission. The mission that Jesus had given to his disciples was very clear. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The disciples had become so established, so ensconced in Jerusalem that they thought they couldn't leave. Remember, verse 1, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout, throughout Judea and Samaria. <coughs> The scattered church has to part with the establishment in order to fulfill the mission of God. Many of you know Roger Farrell. He's a missionary to Maine. He's preached here before. He's a good personal friend. When, whenever we go to uh, Maine, we take missionary trips up there. Roger's our contact up there, so we get to see him again. We do what he wants us to do up there. Well, at one time, Roger was a pastor, and he has always had a heart for winning the lost to Christ. And he, has, he, he firmly believes in going to Jerusalem, or excuse me, all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So one day, one of his established church members said to him, You seem to love the lost more than you love us. Roger replied, well, that's just not true. But he said, listen, suppose we go to the beach one day, and when you and I are sitting on the beach, and we look out there, and there's a man drowning, and you turn to me and you say, I want you to rub some suntan lotion on my back. Would you rather me rub suntan lotion on your back or go save the man who's being saved? Unfortunately, too many established Christians would rather that we rub suntan lotion on their backs than to try to save drowning people. 
Folks, there's drowning people all around us, all around us in Sumter, South Carolina. We know it, we see it, and we're still rubbing suntan lotion on each other's backs. Trust me, I've been doing this a long time. Established Christians would much prefer that we rub the suntan lotion on their backs than to try to save the drowning person. Does this mean that everybody should quit their church? Absolutely not. What this means is that we have been given a God-given opportunity to change the way we do church. In the midst of this pa pandemic, God is offering us a gift. He's saying change. Join Him in His work in His kingdom, which is on the outside. And there's, listen, there's a very simple formula. There's a very simple formula for changing. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. I would challenge every Christian. I would challenge every church right now. Do not go back to being the same. I know everybody's saying, I can't wait to get back. I can't wait to, uh, uh, to be, be able to fellowship again and worship again. And, and I feel that too. But I do not want to go back to being the same. We, what we need to do is we need a plan, we need a strategy, and we need a priority. And that is to go into all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. God's offering us that opportunity today. You know, there was a time I can remember, because I'm old enough to remember it, but uh, the Southern Baptist Convention had a thing called Bold Mission Thrust. And Bold Mission Thrust was to preach the gospel to every living person. I, I forgot the name, the, I think it was by the year 2000. I can't remember. But, the, but we got sidetracked. There, there was an argument, a, a complaint, a huge complaint in the convention, and we got off track. And, I, and, and to me, I haven't heard that much about Southern Baptist churches doing missions since then or evangelism. We, we're given an opportunity here. We're given a mission here. Let's go back and do it right this time. The scattered church preaches the word of God. Verse 4, those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. I love that verse. The scattered church have been driven out of their comfort zone. They've had to leave everything that made them comfortable. And I'm not talking about just their jobs or their homes or their bank accounts. They had to leave their church. They had to leave the comfort of their fellowship. And let me tell you, they had some really good fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, one of the things that they were devoted to, they were committed to, was fellowship and the breaking of the bread. That means they met in each other's homes. They went out to restaurants together, and they, just like all of us. And, you know, Sunday morning, as soon as, as soon as the service is over with, we're all running down to the Mexican restaurant. And I miss that Mexican restaurant, too. I don't know you do. But we enjoy that fellowship, and it's a good thing. When they were separated from the comfort of the established church, they had to rely solely on the Word of God. When they were stripped of the comfort of that fellowship, they were scattered, and they recognized that their sole task was to preach the Word of God. You know what a, a scattered church does not have? A scattered church doesn't have a, a whole lot of programs. A scattered church doesn't have a whole lot of comfort issues to deal with complainers. And they don't feel the need to compete with other churches to see who can get the most believers into their building. About the only thing the, church, the scattered church has left is the Word of God. Philip preached that word. You know what that word was? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God who came to serve, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for our sins, was buried and resurrected on the third day. And if we believe in Him, we can have eternal life and be resurrected along with Him. That's the Word. That's the Word Philip preached. That's the Word the scattered church preached. And that's the Word we need to be preaching in our community today. Sometimes when we strip everything away, we can see a little bit more clearly. Jane and I have an old house and an old house has a lot of uh, uh, maintenance requirements. For several months, I've been watching that on my back porch. This little area just keeps, keeps getting a little bit bigger. Uh, I can tell there's, there's something going on there, but I don't, I don't quite know what it is. So I got a ladder out recently. I climbed up there, and right at the end of that fascia board, there's, there's some rock going on. But the rest of the board seemed pretty, you know, pretty good. I thought, nah, there's, there's, there's got to be something going on behind that board. So I took out a saw and I cut off a piece. And sure enough, there was a lot of rot going on back there where the, where the water, the rainwater had been draining behind it. I have a fear that that might be the case in American Christianity today. I pay a lot of attention, or I have paid a lot of attention for many years now, and it seems to me that the American church has gotten further and further away from the Word of God. I said earlier that I was thankful for, for being scattered. Another reason I'm thankful is because there seems to be a return to the Word of God. 
You know, when you've been stripped of all the trappings of the modern church, all we have left is God's Word. When those believers in Jerusalem were stripped of their fellowship, then they, verse 4, preached the Word wherever they went. I've said this recently, and I want to say it again. As soon as we can, our evangelism team is going to start home Bible groups. And the emphasis in those home Bible groups is going to be teaching the Word of God. Stripping away everything but the essential thing, the Word of God. And listen, if you don't like the traditional church, if, if you've been hurt by a traditional church and, and you're not a believer, maybe you're not a believer, but you're a little curious, you need to let me know. We'd like to get you in one of these groups to talk. Maybe you'd like to find, maybe you're an atheist and you just, you just want to, you want, you, want to, you want to hear it. Maybe you want to debate it, whatever. You're welcome. That's what these home groups are for. They're not so that we can have just more fellowship and be good and rub suntan lotion on our backs in a different venue. We want you to come and hear the Word of God. The scattered church produces a lot of joy. Look at verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of the many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. You know, one of the things that makes this passage so important is that the, the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. It was a racial issue. I mean, you've got to go all the way back to, to 740 B.C. when the Assyrians came in and they conquered the northern kingdom. You've heard the lost tribes of Israel. That's what they were. That's what these were, the lost tribes of Israel. The Assyrians came in. This, the Assyrians had a resettlement policy. They didn't want any nation or any group of people to, uh, to get strong and rise up against them. So they had a resettlement policy. And what they would do is they would take all the conquered people all over their, their empire and they'd, they'd move them around. And so, and then they begin to intermarry with each other and they, they begin to adopt each other's religious ways and all. And so that, uh, that religious and ethnic identity was stripped away. Well, the Judeans couldn't have that. They didn't like that. To them, that was a horrible thing. They didn't, they didn't consider the Samaritans worth people worshiping with or being around anymore. So all those many years, they hated each other. Now God wants them to put aside their differences and accept His Son as their Savior. And when they do, there's going to be great joy in the city of Samaria. You know, one of the problems with having an established church is, is, is that efficiency can replace the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that produces joy in us. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. You know, in a well-oiled, smooth-running machine, there's no place for spontaneity. Everything runs like a clock. And we've got God down to 60 minutes a week, don't we? You know, if God's going to act, He's got to act in that 60 minutes one time a week. I was preaching one time, it was a long time ago, this was before we even had the sanctuary, preaching what we call our fellowship hall. I was preaching over there, and I could see on everybody's faces, God had been blessing all through that worship service. And I could see as I was preaching, people were hanging on, they were loving it. They were, getting, they were being fed by God. I don't know, it might have been a couple of minutes after 12 o'clock, but somebody on the very back, very back pew, threw his arm up like this. We wore, we wore uh, wristwatches back then. That, I'll tell you how long ago it was. He threw his arm up like that and looked at his watch like, buddy, you're running over. He obviously didn't have any joy. He obviously preferred the establishment church to being God's people. You know, when we're outside the church building, there isn't a clock and the Spirit can produce as much joy as He wants. The scattered church allows the Spirit to move and the Spirit makes us joyful. You know, I talked about this a little bit last week. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to make us joy. He produces joy in our lives. And when we get that Word of God, you know, I know we'll forget when I, when I got saved. Man, I felt like a burden was just lifted off of me. All the darkness, all the sin, all the black in my soul was just lifted off at one time. And I read the Bible and I cried. And I went, all that night, read the Bible and cried for joy. Listen, if you want to be part of the scattered church, you need to let me know. 
There's going to be some numbers on the screen. We're going to give an invitation here in just a minute, and the, the uh, praise team is going to sing, come and sing a song. And call one of those numbers, okay? Or you can, you can send a Facebook message. I'll, I'll get that message. But if you want to be a part of the scattered church, call. Let us know. It's time <coughs> that we got on mission. It's time that we fulfilled what Jesus gave to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Be my witnesses. Be, you be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Be a part of that. Give us a call. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you, if you don't know him, but you've been wondering about him, give us a call too. We can, we can help you. We can talk to you about it. Don't be ashamed. If you don't seek, you don't find. All of us that you're going to be talking to on the phone or in emails or, 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 or through Facebook, we, we were seekers. And we found the greatest joy. You, can, you can't even imagine that joy. So let us know. Contact us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you have gotten us outside the church. You closed the doors, Father. Praise you for that. And you made us, Lord, focus on you, your mission, and your word. And now, God, do not let us lose it. Continue to challenge us, Father, to be the scattered church. We've got a big community here in Sumter, Father. A lot of people don't know you. Help us, God. Convict us, God, to witness the name of Jesus to these people. In your name we pray. Amen. to the Lord.